The following interview at Mark Windows ended up being much longer than we had both anticipated. So what I've done is I've decided to split the interview into a part one and a part two. Now, we touched on many, many different subjects, and Mark in particular is an expert on the environmental movement. And he's one of these people who is able to give you all the information in a way that's very easy to understand. And he just unpacks it beautifully. Now, we touched on many other subjects as well. And uh, some of the subjects are as follows. So we talked on the occult, out-of-body experiences, social engineering, totalitarianism, globalism, extinction rebellion. And he really exposes that and its connection to the Occupy movement consensus, agenda 2030, citizens assemblies and how they're used, change agents, a one world system, cashless society, the hive mind, demonic possession, demonic entities, new age at the UN, immigration, sustainable development, Ireland and Gemma O'Doherty, power cuts and rationing. So you are now listening to part one. Be sure to go on and listen to part two as soon as it's available. And uh, I really hope you enjoy it. Okay, bye bye. Because if someone's telling you something and you don't want to believe it and you refuse to believe it, then that means you're living in an illusion and also you're living under self-deception. Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to this edition of the Irish Megaphone. Now, uh, I've got a very, ex well, it's exciting for me because this is one of my favorite YouTube channels and podcasts that I listen to and that I discovered uh, recently um, over the last few months. Um, so it's hosted by a gentleman by the name of Mark Windows. Now, Mark has a website. It's called windowsontheworld.net. And uh, I think you're all going to be very, very interested in, in this particular interview. We'll touch on a few subjects, on quite a few subjects. And I'm hoping that maybe at some stage in the future, Mark will come back again and maybe we can talk about certain things in more detail. But Mark, uh, welcome to uh, welcome to the Irish Megaphone channel. How are you? Very well, Paul. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, it's absolutely my pleasure. I was really excited about about doing this interview, you know. So, look, Mark, um, just just as a uh, just from the outset there, what, what I'm curious about are maybe I know I'm always curious about it when I hear an interview online. I'm always curious about the person themselves um, as well as their information, of course. But, Mark, we kind of have a kind of maybe a similar background. We've both had, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, we've come from a background in media or music or sound and things like that. I mean, could you just tell me a little bit about yourself and growing up uh, just briefly and, you know, what your general background is? and maybe you know how you came to be interested in in a lot of the uh, subjects that you talk about on your show well, it's interesting paul because my background in a way is a mixture of extreme introversion and extreme extroversion mm -hmm. because i started to get into music when i was about 14 15 learned to play the drums joined bands when i left school sort of wrote songs and hung around with people who were quite a lot older than me. And they'd take me to gigs and I went to all these clubs with these bands in, in the days of the punk days, really, and just after that. Yeah. And I found it all exciting. And I really liked the sort of buzz of it all and performing. Mm -hmm. And eventually I got into being more of a performer. And I did a bit of sort of street type theatre stuff and performance. And then it all led on to doing this comedy show, which I took up to Edinburgh in the mid nineties. Right. I didn't know that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I'd been in bands before for a long time, but then I started to touring the show and it was like a very over the top kind of rock act. It was covers, but it was also kind of impersonations and very tongue in cheek, but very, very energetic. Yeah. I was very inspired by sort of great rock and roll performers. And what I tried to do was, put everything that all those great performers had kind of put across on stage into one act. So it was very zany in a way, but also it was kind of, a lot of people found it very confrontational because it was very over the top. But after a few numbers, they would go, oh, I'm really enjoying this, you know. Yeah, yeah, so I yeah. did that for a long time. And I'd always been researching ever since I was a kid. I'd been looking into what we call the occult, which just means hidden, mm -hmm. and the way things work. So I've, I've got this very kind of serious side, which kind of took over. And I've become much more 
kind of focused on the machinations of how the world works. And mm -hmm. it's an interesting dichotomy because when you go into, say, performance, it's totally the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And so now I don't do much in the way of performance apart from talks. So the kind of background of being a showman and all the rest of it means that I can just get up really in front of an audience without thinking about it. So that kind of helps. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether that answers your question, but it's kind of part of the history of how I got into it. Well, no, it, it does answer my... I can kind of relate to a lot of that, Mark, because um, I think uh, in my natural self, I would I was quite gregarious when I was a child, but when I, when I, when I kind of went into my teens, I closed up a little bit. I, I became... Um, <laughs> I became quite shy, you know, and I think that like, uh, especially being into music, like I've, I've played a lot of gigs and it took me, it was overcoming that shyness, but I, I, I kind of get what you're saying that once you, it's like any acquired skill, I suppose that, um, I know, for example, many people's greatest fear is actually speaking in public and that doesn't, even though by nature, I'm, I wouldn't call myself an extrovert. I'm kind of. I don't know. I suppose I'm I'm halfway in between, but it is a skill you develop, and I can see how it's very transferable. The skill of playing music at live gigs or, or doing shows, and then transferring that skill into presenting radio shows or um, uh, presenting YouTube channels, or like what you're doing with Piers Corbin and Sandy Adams, the the bigger picture events. You know, so I can kind of relate to that. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like it's a skill that I use. The funny thing about it is that I'm not the sort of person who needs attention all the time. In fact, I don't like it. I find it quite dull, really, all that sort of attention seeking. But it's almost like it's a skill that I use. So it was the same when I did my shows. I would dress up in this bloody leopard skin suit, you know, and mad costume. And it'd be just like this mad rock and roll character would just appear. I sat there totally motionless in some dressing room, you know, with a broken bingo machine and listening to the listening to the quiz or the bingo ready to go on. And then this kind of animal would burst in and I would kind of get a bit of a kick out of it because I could see that they wanted something to entertain them. And I was going to make sure that I did. So it was kind of a job and it was just something I switched on and off without even thinking about it in the end. And I actually got how over the top the act was because at some places they were completely freaked out, you know. And But the thing is that I just see it as a skill and it's something that I don't need to do all the time. I mean, yeah. it's interesting because I worked with some great musicians recently, really good uh, old school rockers, you know, who really know their, their stuff. And and to work with people <clears throat> of that caliber, I find a real buzz because I'm more of a performer, really. That's where my strengths were. And as a sort of vocal impersonator and performer. And I just love the buzz of working with really good people who you get up on stage with. And sometimes you don't even know what you're going to do. Yeah. And then you get up and deliver something. And it's a kind of fascinating thing isn't it because you you go to these places um often the people don't really know who you are you know unless you've got a big name mm -hmm. and even i've worked with people who i've got quite a big name and there's still a lot of people don't know who they are so mm -hmm. you, t you turn up at these places you do this gig and it kind of goes into the ether and then you go on to the next one and i did that for years and years and sometimes i actually really miss it because get such a buzz out of it and it's very inspiring in a way it mm -hmm. kind of gives you you know the inspiration to do other things mm -hmm. so there's, there's a lot to be said for it and it's something that i do miss actually yeah, yeah. and why why mark did no i totally i totally get that i, I can t i'm totally relating to everything you're saying there now mark can you tell me mark why did you feel you had to give that up or um why do, like what what actually happened in your life or did anything happen? Maybe nothing happened. I don't know that caused you to kind of walk away from that or take a break from it at least. Well, it was my main source of income for a really long time. And so every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'd be going out. I remember when gigs were a lot more plentiful and we were doing all sorts of different kind of gigs, even though it was a kind of covers, but it's a very different kind of thing. It was a show really. And very over the top. And what made me give it up was the fact that the work was drying up. The money wasn't getting any more. I mean, you know, you know yourself of being mm -hmm. a musician, Paul, the money hasn't gone up for 25 years. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's gone down. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if mm-hmm. you want to go and go out and do a gig. And the thing is that you go out and knock yourself out. And I got fed up in a way because what I found was that the audiences seemed to be getting more apathetic as well. And people didn't want to put any effort in at all. Mm-hmm. I remember when it was quite exciting, but mm-hmm. I found that the level I was doing it at was actually not really doing me any favors, you know. So also, as it was the mu- as the music thing was drying up, I got more into this. And in 2014, I was still gigging when I joined the People's Voice, which is this ill-fated uh, TV station, mm-hmm. which David Icke was involved with. I met Richie Allen there, and the, me and Richie are still friends. And it's that I put everything into. And I was still doing my gigs at the time. Then David asked me to do a, a show every day, so that became a full-time job. And so I was working 10 hours a day on Windows on the World, which was what we called the show, and I was doing a live show every day. And then that became my role until the people's voice fell apart Mm -hmm. and had to close down. And when it closed down, I thought, I'm not stopping doing this. I'm going to keep going now because previously, sorry, I have to rewind a little bit here. Mm -hmm. I used to run a website called landofthefree.co.uk, which is now gone. But we were dealing with all this stuff like uh, the corruption in the courts and how to deal with bailiffs and council tax. Mm -hmm. And we were doing that um, way before 2014. I was doing that about 2008, 2009. Right. Um, I was really into it then. So it goes back that far. And and so, yes, I decided after that where the people's voice had kind of fallen apart to actually carry on doing it regardless. And it's been quite a slog, but we do seem to be getting somewhere And I've just had all of this research um, and background in it, you know, that I've been looking into for a long time now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Mark, can I just rewind you there? Uh, There's one or two things you said just kind of caught my attention. The first thing are you you talked about the occult and um, you talked about this idea of people at gigs or people wanting to be entertained uh, I, I kind of know what you mean. Do you think that there's this need people have, let's say, uh, it, taking your example, this need to be entertained, it's essentially something inside of people where they want to avoid reality or they want to, you know, uh, avoid thinking about the more, let's say, serious things of life? Or Absolutely. And I'd often be sat in a dressing room at some holiday camp, you know, waiting to go on. And I'd look out at the people um, you know, sort of basically getting drunk or playing bingo or really not that you just think, look at them and go, God, is this what it's about for these people? You know, and it's not it's not like a snobbery. It's just that I don't think like that. And I would never kind of go to those sort of places that I played at, which is interesting. You know, mm-hmm. I, there's certain bands, for instance, that I really like. There's certain bands, just one or two, actually, now that I go and see because I've been following them for years. Mm-hmm. But apart from that, I mean, my friend's pub, she has music on all the time, and it's really good, but I'm kind of in a different state of mind and all that, and I I, I prefer actually getting down to working on things and learning. I don't really have much time for entertainment in my life. I think that's what I'm trying to say. (laughs) I I kind of totally relate to that. You know, when I look back when I was a bit younger, you know, your your life tends to, or can can tend to... uh, uh, Maybe not always in my case, but I used to see it a lot of my friends where your life kind of revolves around the weekend or revolves around um, some kind of having some kind of entertainment in your life, be it going to the pub or gigs or the cinema. And that's that became that that's the part of your life that actually your 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 essence revolved around in the sense that you kind of tolerated work, but you lived for the weekend, you know. And um, yeah, I saw a lot of that as well uh, in, in, you know, in, in my uh, gigging career, let's say, you know, and it can be. And I know what you mean. It's you would look at some people and you kind of feel a sense of and I, again, I don't mean it in a snobbish way or I don't mean it in a condescending way, but you kind of in some ways would feel sorry for people, you know, when you were talking about looking at people and wondering, will you project yourself into the minds of these people where they're saying, look, is this all there is to life? You know, going out, 
getting drunk, falling down. As you know, uh, I'm, I'm a Christian, so I, I would kind of, there was a, f- a famous, um, a well-known uh, f- French philosopher, uh, Blaise, I think it's Blaise Pascal, and he often quoted his most, one of his most famous quotes is that, you know, inside every man is this God-shaped hole, and man spends their lives trying to to fill that hole with uh, material things, or money, or sex, or drugs, or entertainment you know and i suppose the idea being that that hole can only if you like accommodate one thing uh, which i personally believe is a personal relationship with god you know so what would your view on that be uh, mark yeah i think we're getting into some really interesting areas here because i think a lot of it revolves around escapism but when it comes down to it in the long term it's ultimately about a fear of death or not being able to acknowledge that you are actually just awareness in the moment. I mean, I don't want to get new agey, because these terms have been hijacked, you see. Things like awareness and consciousness, to me, they've been hijacked. So they don't actually mean what the essence of them actually is anymore. But I'd like to make that delineation. But, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing, because once I started exploring sort of metaphysical stuff and things like out of body experiences, I started having these spontaneous out-of-body experiences and it totally changed my life because you realize that this consciousness, in my opinion, probably does survive the death of the body. Now, I've got no conclusive proof of that because obviously I'm still alive, Mm -hmm. but I find this such a fascinating area. And yes, what I've kind of looked at is the way that people are happy with a very limited state of consciousness. And that is really what delineates uh, people from moving on or stops them moving on. And this is a, a really interesting area that when people get trapped into a very narrow life experience and a lot of the social engineering revolves around people limiting themselves and do you think that a lot of these limitations are self-imposed or do you would you say that they are kind of imposed by other people or people around people in general well the custodial aspect of society and this totalitarianism that we talk about a lot on my shows is really a big social engineering project because if you've got a custodial view of the world which globalists and people at the at the very top, what, what used to be called a priest class have, then you are prone, I would suggest, to want to engineer society in a certain way. And the thing is that most of the public don't understand this. The difference between globalists and the public is that globalists think really big and the public think really small. Mm-hmm. Um, the most of the public, including us, we would think about our immediate comforts and are we okay if we've got a roof over our head and, um, you know, basic things. But when you start thinking about bigger things, the smaller things um, and the, the kind of obsession with petty day-to-day trivia, which is rammed down people's throats, if they watch any form of media, television, um, any kind of media with advertising, most media is reinforcing this totally narrow, fear-driven view of life. Mm-hmm. So in other words, it's actually self-perpetuating. So people think small and then they watch television and that keeps them thinking small. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. this is but this, there's a reason for that because there's an idea of health, wealth and happiness and all this and people are entitled to quiet enjoyment of property um, and they're entitled to have some leisure time and then they work. It's the kind of thing is that all they, people don't realize that their lives have been absolutely micromanaged from day one. And that's where it gets interesting, I think, when you start looking at how your life's been micromanaged and start seeing it outside. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting. And um, can I just, before we move into the 
main body of uh, you've kind of caught my attention now with one or two things uh, of what we're going to talk about. Can I just just briefly go back? You, you said when you were young, you had an interest in the occult and you did a lot of research into the occult. Could you just tell me a little bit more about that, Mark? I'm just I think my listeners, because it, it came up in the conversation and I, I just have a feeling that a lot of the listeners would uh, would find that interesting, you know? Yeah. What is now called parapsychology, this term that was coined in the 60s, really. And people like Charles Tart and D. Scott Roggo. Mm -hmm. I started looking at all that stuff when I was about 14, 15, and I found the paranormal extraordinarily interesting. Mm -hmm. So that was my sort of gateway into what would be called the occult. And then, of mm -hmm. course, you get bombarded with all this stuff, which is kind of going to the new age, which I now dutifully avoid because I've developed critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And once you develop critical thinking, then a lot of this stuff, which is kind of basically fluffy escapism dressed up in mythology, and it's kind of a self-empowerment, you know, it goes into this kind of think and grow rich stuff. It all came out of that, really. Mm -hmm. The new age really dovetails into that. It's all about the self. It's all about me, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, the, the, the background of all that, looking into it, was, was really about um, an interest in the paranormal and what became known as psychology. I was always fascinated by that, you know, the extraordinary. Yeah, I think human beings are generally always interested in the supernatural. I, I think it's just, an, I think it's an inbuilt desire within all human beings to be interested in the supernatural. Now, my personal reason or the reason I believe that is is because I believe that's the way God created uh, mankind to be interested in the supernatural because if you think about it really logically um, uh, for me for example being a Christian it's kind of uh, part of the job description to believe in the supernatural you know but I do remember when I was a, a teenager uh, my brother used to have a lot of books on the occult and I used to actually I took I have to admit I took quite an interest in it I used to read those books and um, I remember a reading through some of those things and you know reading about out of, out of body astro travel and out of body experiences and I do uh, remember trying to <laughs> trying to um, use whatever techniques I could you know you know when you're that young you don't really have the uh, you, discernment to know what you're what you're messing around with and now luckily uh, well I say now luckily looking back I, I I never managed to experience those things but I did but just before I became a Christian I got involved in Silva mind control which was again just uh, another new age practice you know but then after I, I became a Christian I kind of Silver method the Sil the S I. LVA method, yeah. Yeah, I think he this, that guy came from, was it Mexico or California or something like that? There was all these guys. Yes, of... I knew people who were kind of in, interested in it. It didn't really activate me that much, but I, I looked at it and I thought, yes, it's another kind of hook, you know, it's kind of a new age thing. Uh, you know, it's the thing is with gurus is there's a lot of them and they, none of them know any more than you do, usually, you know. Yeah, it's um, what you said there. You were talking about new wages because I, I find myself if I'm having a chat with a new wager from my perspective now, remember, as a Christian, I, I will normally um, let's say I might have a conversation with someone. I might be if, if they're chatting to me about new age or we're chatting on the topic, I would kind of be sharing with people um, the, the kind of biblical worldview on, on such practices, you know, and it's interesting what you say about. Uh, new agers it's very i find it's very difficult for a new ager if you think about it really the the like for example when i became a christian right i came to a point in my life where i realized i'm speaking theologically now if you know what i mean mark um where i realized you know i'm actually lost you know the bible uses an old-fashioned word it's called i'm a sinner um but i found i find quite a lot that when i'm chatting to to new agers that's a very difficult hurdle for them to overcome, to admit, for example, they're uh, spiritually lost or are are sinners, because in the mind of a new ager, um, it's that's negative thinking, and um, it's, yes, it, you know that's what I mean. A really good point. You know that's negative thinking, and so it's very hard for them to overcome that barrier and admit 
that they are flawed as humans and can never reach perfection, you know, because the Bible says that, that nobody can reach perfection. We're all sinners and in, sinners, meaning, you know, we meet, I suppose the way I would term that is we, we missed imperfect. Yeah. We missed the target. You know, God is perfect. We're imperfect and there's nothing we can do to if you like, bridge that gulf. And so I do find that with New Agers when I chat to them, that sense of it's no, no, that's negative thinking. No, no, I, no, no. I just have to think positive thoughts more and keep repeating my affirmations, you know. So <laughs> so I find that quite it's interesting. It's a form of brainwashing and it's overt mind control. Yeah. And the thing is that I've seen a lot of it and I've been around it an awful lot and I've seen the damage that it does. And I'm very much against it. And I'll tell you what it really is to me. It's this acquiescence from responsibility mm -hmm. and immersion in ego is actually what it is. And the whole idea of it in the first place was to get away from that. But that's what it feeds mm -hmm. because it's all about self. It's all about me, me, me and how I feel. And mm -hmm. these people I meet who are New Agers are the most self-centered narcissists I've ever met. They don't care about anybody else but themselves. Ultimately, they just pretend to. And there's a huge deception. And it's a big social engineering program. And it was brought into the UN in the 70s by Robert Mueller, who was the gen uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. And he recruited a lot of these New Age and Hindu groups because he knew that Westerners who were into Hinduism were into acquiescence from all responsibility. And a lot of them were under the influence of psychedelic drugs and also marijuana. So all of this is what they call a lostness of the mind. And we can see that now. We can see the results of the lostness of the mind when you get these fake globalist protest groups like Extinction Rebellion, that is the lostness of the mind. And I see this everywhere. I'm in a place where there's a lot of new ages and I avoid all of them because I've heard it all before. And the entitlement and the spoiled attitudes of a lot of these people, uh, it's basically, I mean, from your point of view, we could say from a Christian point of view, it's Luciferian. It's, it's actually bordering on black magic and Satanism, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And that's to do with the gateways that are opened up through the drugs that they take. So I've seen the damage that all this does. And I actually am really against it now because people very close to me who got into all this stuff and became mentally ill. And I see an awful lot of mental instability around these people and this kind of, it's a hive mind. It's another artificial womb. Isn't that what happened to Peter Green of Fleetwood Mac? He was, um, I think he was dropping some acid or something like that or some psychedelics and he never came back. Well, interestingly, a friend of mine wanted me to make a video and it was a fella who actually used to sell acid in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And she'd written a book about him and the connection of LSD and the CIA and mind control programs. And this chap was famous, basically famous, for giving Sid Barrett of Pink Floyd the acid, which actually he never recovered from. And what I couldn't get over was that these people were actually proud of it. So in other words, you've, you've actually given someone, you've administered an illegal drug to someone that's profoundly altered their mental state and their mental health forever. Mm -hmm. And 40 years later, you're still bragging about it. And this is the kind of deception that goes on around this kind of pop culture and new age stuff. Yeah, there's a verse in the Bible, you know, <laughs> it's from First Timothy. It talks about... Um, uh, it says like the the spirit clearly says in the later in the last days some will abandon the faith, and follow deceiving spirits and and things uh, taught by demons. But you were talking there. You mentioned psychedelics, and I think that's a good kind of bridge into um, uh, extinction rebellion because we know that psychedelic drugs are an inherent part of occultic practice. Isn't that right, Mark? Yes, and the thing is about it is when you get people like Gail Bradbrook saying that she had an ayahuasca ceremony and she was given the codes of social change. What you've got here is two things going on. Mm -hmm. You've got this kind of so-called mystical experience, which may not be a mystical experience at all. It's a hallucination. Mm -hmm. um, or, it, you know, point is, let's not get too much into that side of it. So you've, got, you've changed your awareness, your natural state, and then you're saying 
that somehow this has given you the codes of social change. Well, I don't know anybody who's taken a, a so-called mind-altering or mind-consciousness-expanding drug who's ever said they've come back from it and been given the codes of social change. Now, what, what this is, it, this is the social engineering brainwashing that she's already taken on, coming out, um, kind of, she's, she's funneling it through another experience. Now, what I see here is the deception of these people, the self-deception, is incredible, but they've all been mentored into basically a, a, a very, very simple social engineering program. And it's all based on controlling uh, people, uh, group control and group manipulation. And that's basically what we're talking about here. So it's interesting that they that they come out with these things. And one of the founder people of Extinction Rebellion and Gail Bradbrook were doing these talks at Conway Hall about psychedelics. Now, when you actually hear what these people say, they know nothing. And this is a really important point, I think, because I've spent most of my life researching and looking into things in quite a deep way. And then you realize that these people will come along and they think they've got the answer to everything. And they're the ones who are incredibly easy to manipulate because they don't have the depth of experience. What, what do we know, Mark, about uh, Gail Bradbrook? Now, I know she's um, some kind of doctor. I did hear her on some interview last week. I don't know, was it on talk radio with Julia Brewer? What's her name? I can't remember who it was. It mightn't have been her. But I was listening to the interview and she came across to me as someone who didn't really sound that smart. No, they're not. And that's that's the interesting thing. So so the, the whole concept behind this is perplexing to anybody who would think it's a protest because it's not a protest. It's a lobbying organization and it's a globalist lobbying organization. Now, these two people, Roger Hallam and Gail Bradbrook, are at the front of it. There's another fellow called George Barder, and all of these three are the directors of a company called Compassionate Revolution Limited. Now, when you start looking into the person who's now disappeared from the front line, George Barder, if you go on to brianhaw.tv, I don't know whether people will remember Brian Hall, but he was a peace campaigner and he was protesting against the Iraq war with a lady called Barbara Tucker in Parliament Square. Mm -hmm. And he was harangued mercilessly by people that he said were working for the intelligence services. And one of those people was George Barder, who's one of the managing directors of Extinction Rebellion. Now, his brother's also into some kind of social engineering. So what you've got here, let's look at it this way. You've got people who are into psychology. It may be very basic, but they're into psychology. Where does that lead into? That leads into social engineering. Now, these people are being manipulated and used and funded by people who do know what they're doing. So this Extinction Rebellion is a follow-on from previous template protests, and I've studied most of them since Occupy. Mm -hmm. And I found out how the whole thing works, and what we've got here is a template. Now, this is the biggest, it's the most banal, and it's also the most dangerous because what they are actually wanting to impose on everybody is global totalitarianism on the back of a lie that was created by billionaires, which is climate change, or the, or the idea that anth anthropogenic global warming mm -hmm. is real and has been proven when in fact it hasn't. I did see Roger Hallam on Hard Talk BBC. I think I did mention that to you on the phone. And yes. he just came across to me as... The only the war that comes to mind is sinister, a very sinister character. Do you know what I mean? Is, I is, is that person who could be very easily used for nefarious purposes? <laughs> sorry. Hello, I'm still there. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Mark. Yeah, my apologies. Yeah, I can edit that out. Yeah, you could. yeah but that's that's kind of the way it comes across because. There's actually not much going on in there, yeah. but something could be injected into that psyche mm -hmm. that could be useful or dangerous to the right people. He was talking about flying drones over Heathrow Airport and the, the interviewer was kind of um, pointing out to him, well, you know, do you not think that's putting people's lives at risk? And he was kind of, well, you know, that's... Uh, 
we're not saying we're going to do it. We're not saying we're not going to do it. Um, it, it was it was all a bit bizarre, you know. Well, yeah. The, the, again, it's the lostness of the mind. I mean, when I went down to well, Downing Street, actually, I mean, we know they're on this massive two week protest at the moment. When it all started, myself and Piers Corbyn, several others went down to uh, outside Downing Street. And there was a load of them lying on the floor, having a die in. I'd never seen anything like this before. So yeah, they were, they were basically too, a yeah, yeah. Smug, smug, spoiled idiots, really, all kind of <clears throat> looking very happy with themselves and lying on the pavement. And one of them had a big banner around her and she was kind of welcoming us. And we were just saying, well, you know that this is a funded thing to bring in a totalitarian kind of agenda on the back of a lie. And she goes, oh, I'm a part of a lie, am I? Oh, you know. And <laughs> this fellow's father was there. Yeah. And one of the kids, you know, is lying on the floor. And he said, I've driven all the way from Worcester for this. And I think, well, you, you're obviously not worried about your carbon footprint, then are you? So he's driven all the way from Worcester for his son to lie on the floor outside Downing Street. Then he's going to drive home again. And the, the actual kind of justification for this was, well, you have to do something, don't you? Mm -hmm. Now, I can understand some of those people who see it as a social kind of get-together saying that. But I can't understand the parent of one of these people who's there saying that. And also, I said, well, you do know that the foundation document of Extinction Rebellion, the special report 15, um, has been totally misrepresented by this group. And he looked at me completely blankly and hadn't a clue what I was talking about. So I said, well, you don't really know why you're here if you haven't read that document, because that's the foundation document of this group. Mm -hmm. And also the lead author of that IPCC document has actually said that Extinction Rebellion have completely misrepresented and misinterpreted what's in the document. Mm -hmm. Mark, so not you, only yeah, sorry, Mark. going on the back of IPC, sorry. No, no worries, no, I was just going to dive, it just did drill in. Could you just explain to our listeners what that document is and how yeah. how you feel yes. Extinction Rebellion are, are misrepresenting that? Well, what it is, it's called the Special Report 15. And what Extinction Rebellion have done is they've jazzed it up and say we've got 10 years to save everything. Now, it doesn't actually say that. It says we need to mitigate against climate change in t within 10 years, which, of course, is not true either, mm -hmm. because there's no proof that anthropogenic global warming is happening. And that's the main thing. So I've read the SR15, and you can read the, the summary documents. Now, that what Extinction Rebellion have done is they've kind of made up all of these sound bites which have turned into this thing called a climate emergency. Now, the whole thing is absurd because by its very nature, we can't be in an emergency mm -hmm. because an emergency, an emergency, isn't it? Say, yeah. say somebody's fallen over and they've cut themselves really badly and they're bleeding to death. That's an emergency. So you'd phone up the emergency services and you'd go, mm -hmm. there's a fellow here, I think he needs an ambulance. And they go, oh, are you sure he needs an ambulance? Yes, he's bleeding to death. He's lost about two pints. But, oh, we'll send an ambulance then. Well, that's an emergency, right? But why do these people not get it? They wake up every day and the weather hasn't really changed. And we're actually in a very stable period for weather. You know, I mean, the whole thing is kind of, it's so absurd, you know? I was saying to my wife there a few days ago, we were, I was watching some YouTube videos and uh, I, uh, one of these Extinction Rebellion, it could have been, it was over the course of a few videos and they all use the same phrases, like for example, uh, an existential crisis is one, is a classic one. You hear Greta saying that, but it's like they're all reading from, it's like the script has been handed out to these various organizations and there's key phrases that they have to use, you know? Well, that's absolutely right. And this goes back to Occupy because Occupy was basically the precursor to this, and it used the same management structure. Yes, Extinction Rebellion has a management structure, and even the people who are at Occupy are now involved with Extinction Rebellion. So they're going, what do we want? A sustainable future. When do we want it now? They were saying that our Occupy, who streets, our streets, all this kind of stuff was being peddled by Occupy because the globalists need the anti-globalists to implement their policies, policies so they give them the sound bites and the banners. Mm -hmm. So these people don't have to have their own minds. They're given where to go, who to follow, and what to say. And they do it. They act accordingly. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Can I ask you, is there, did Gail Bradbrook or Roger Hallam, have they had, did they have any involvement with Occupy? Do you know? Well, this is quite interesting because Gail Bradbrook does go back quite a long way and does have connections with people within Occupy. Now, let's have a look at how it compares with Extinction Rebellion. Mm-hmm. Occupy General Assemblies. General Assemblies turned up when George Soros got involved. This was based on the idea of a facilitator would come along. Now, facilitators are used in a thing called Delphi technique. And the first time I saw Delphi technique was at Occupy. So we have a facilitator and a co-facilitator, and the audience are steered into the intended outcome. In other words, they are given leading questions, and the people who are looking around and basically monitoring what's going on, whether it's by what's being written down or what's being said, will identify the people in the group who are most likely to push the agenda. They will then be given time to speak, and then you will get a thing called consensus. And consensus is nothing to do with everyone agreeing. Consensus means that it's made to look as though everyone does agree. And the first time I saw this was at Occupy. Mm-hmm. And I, I saw this, and the whole point about Delphi technique was it, it was invented by the Rand Corporation in 1953 to gain what they called group consensus within corporations. So, in other words, what we're looking at here is a top-down corporate structure, including the inner core of dragons which protect the center of the group. Now, the first time I saw dragons was when we were Occupy again, because we started questioning the facilitator, a woman called Saskia Kent, who now seems to have had most of her stuff removed from the internet, Mm -hmm. who worked for oil companies. Um, I think she was doing stuff for BP and also for Chamber of Trade and Commerce up in Norfolk. And, And another thing, she was connected with the East Anglia, had the research unit, is that where the, the climate one? Gate oh yeah, I think that's where the climate gate emails originated from, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Hadley Research Units. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, you, yeah. Sorry. Go on. Keep going, Mark. No, it's fine. You, uh, no, I just I, I was kind of thinking that you know, next... as far as the Delphi technique is concerned, that's kind of something you see really at all. They have these kind of public consultations for some crowd want to build a chemical plant or we want to put in bicycle lanes and uh, we, we invite all local citizens from the town to come to this uh, meeting and give your input that we can take into account when in reality um, most of these public consultation, that's the word I'm looking for, yeah. yeah and so and the idea... Like- you would on a local level see do you believe mark uh, these delphi techniques in operation where the the outcome is kind of being st- is already predetermined and uh, it's just a case of you know getting your your local town members in and get them to kind of go along with what they've already determined will be the ultimate outcome well yes the outcome's already been decided and that's the whole point where the citizens assembly thing that extinction rebellion are pushing is basically with no choice. I was looking at it, I did a show on it the other night, last night actually, and I called it Bolshevik Britain. Because what we're talking about here with Extinction Rebellion is they are a kind of very ineffectual uh, personality-wise Bolshevik kind of revolution. Because what it is, they, they're taking over and they are doing it on behalf of global governance. And their totalitarian plan, this kind of created globalist extreme leftism, is totalitarian in the respect that under the UN Agenda 2030, they say no one will be left behind. Now, what it means is that you cannot exist outside this paradigm. So what they are doing is totalitarian and it's intolerant Mm -hmm. and it's done on the back of a lie. Now... It's, it's kind of interesting because this whole thing about citizens' assembly, they were using them in Occupy. They're now saying that this, this citizens' assembly is all over the country, by the way. I was just looking at the one in Oxford. Yeah, I heard, I heard, yeah, I heard uh, a guy from Extinction Rebellion, Dunica. I don't want to surname him. He's actually Irish. I'm sorry to say he was on. Uh, he was being interviewed by Judith Julia. Um, 
I can never remember her surname. Julia uh, Brewer. What's her third name? Julia Hall. Yeah, exactly. No, they seem to anytime they bring an extinct rebellion character on to be interviewed by her, they she destroys each and every one. So there's always a new one that comes along for the next interview, you know. But he was on. I listened to him. I think it was yesterday, and he was again pushing this idea of a citizens' assembly, you know. And and Julie, of course, was pointing out that, but we already have a, a citizens' assembly in the houses of parliament, you know. So um, yeah, of course, I, we had. Uh, this is how you probably are aware that you know in the last few years here in Ireland they created a citizens assembly as well and how they did it is that they um, this was supposedly to um, push forward uh, the introduction of abortion into Ireland which they succeeded in doing and a few years ago um, gay marriage was on the cards and they it's kind of in the process of pushing the whole green thing now and it was a, it, they chose 99 people now these 99 people were were chosen by a polling company, you know, um, and you could make that up. So it was a case of it was a way of, if you like, circumventing uh, the population that this is the way I see it. It was a way of circumventing the population uh, from having any real say in these um, uh, important issues. And uh, the idea being they would uh, they the, the, assemb the assemblies were created to push the idea of a referendum uh, and of course, if you look at the um, the presentation, so this the assembly meet uh, the assembly would meet every so often, every Saturday, every second Saturday, and they would undergo these kind of um, indoctrination presentations. You know where they were. Um, it was essentially one way traffic. There, it seemed to me there was no um, not much balance. Like for example, of the green ones, they it was all the people they had giving presentations on the whole green issues like wind wind turbines and so forth. It was all warmists and alarmists, so there was no balance. That's why they had the the PR company involved, and this is what happens. It doesn't matter whether it's the new development that's being built on your doorstep that nobody wants. It doesn't matter whether it's them closing the roads off or stopping you having a car. They're going to do it the same way because they can't have anything stopping it. So in other words, they give this illusion that there's a choice. Well, there's one choice, no choice. This is what you're getting. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this happen where I used to live in northeast London. I've seen it happen in many boroughs in London. It's happened in all boroughs in London, but I've seen it happening firsthand by going to the meetings and seeing the same template rolled out again. PR companies get involved. They then identify the people locally who are going to be on their side. They want their very kind of plodding, useful idiots who they can recruit. And then they go into all the diversity stuff, so they make them all look a bit different. But we're not talking about people with critical thinking here. Mm -hmm. And the point is, we don't even know who they are. So the whole thing is an absolute sham. And what it's to do is to take away even the illusion of democracy. This is a totalitarian system that we're in now. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it escalate since 2015. It doesn't matter whether it's a fake protest, a globalist protest like the Extinction Rebellion. It doesn't matter whether it's your local council closing all your roads off. It's all done in the same way, mm -hmm. by Mark, consensus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mark, can you just explain to uh, the listeners what a change agent is? And, and um, I know you've mentioned that uh, quite a lot on your shows that I've heard and you, know, you keep referring to change agents. Can you just talk a bit about a change, what a change agent, a change agent is and how a change agent operates? Well, what it is, it's actually a corporate idea. And if you've got a company and it's not performing very well, you bring in change agents. It's well known. A lot of people just say, yes, I'm a change agent, right? Now, when we're looking at something like what people think is democracy, the way that the globalists see it is a corporate structure. So in a corporate structure, you have to control every level. So what you do is you bring people in to control the narrative of public opinion. And they're called change agents. Now, in my slideshow, I've got adverts where they're saying, become a UN change agent, be the change. And basically, what all is a change agent's doing is steering the public into the already predetermined outcome. So these people are trained in the public and private sector, and they th there's nothing very mysterious about it. There's hundreds of thousands of these people. And they came out of the big society. David Cameron's big society in 2010 said that they were going to bring in people, 
using Saul Alinsky rules for radicals, which we can get on to later. Mm -hmm. Well, the point is that there was a company called Unlimited, UN Limited, right? Unlimited. And they recruit change agents and social entrepreneurs. There's hundreds of these companies, but let's look at that one. They are embedded in countries all over the world. And what they're doing is they are imposing this form of new global democracy or totalitarianism into other countries. So it doesn't matter whether they're empowering women by telling them to have abortions, um, basically splitting up the family. They're, they're, what they're doing is they are working on behalf of global governance. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if they're trying to control the narrative in your local area and get the roads closed down or whether they're empowering indigenous people in countries all over the world. The end result is going to be the same. They're steering people into what is a global action plan, which means that it's totalitarian, but it's corporate in its structure. So change agents are just people who are imposing change for the intended outcome. And yes, trained in the public and private sector. They turn up, they're usually very, very belligerent, they're very determined, and there's different levels of, of how draconian this gets. Now, I know for a fact that change agents can go from people who you see in your local council and think, well, they're not very bright, they're very bolshy, and this can be to the sort of attitude you get on the phone. So when you phone up an organisation, which I did the other day, um, first of all, I was giving them some information which was about how people could be kept out of prison by the, by the police basically not destroying evidence and stopping uh, defence witnesses from giving evidence and basically stitching up defence witnesses. Now, you'd think they'd be interested in that, right? It's a thing called the Prison Reform Trust. So I got onto one of the main people there because a friend of mine had put me onto them. Now, the woman on the other end, she put on her best minor key sad you're a loser voice sorry to <laughs> oh i'm sorry to hear that oh yes yeah i know and all this and uh, basically patronizing me mm. and then when i got more animated she started accusing me of being aggressive and used it to terminate the call and what i said to her before i was back to me who terminated the call i said you are a waste of space because I've given you information which your charitable trust under its own constitution should actually take on board. So I said, people are fed up of these organizations with judges and these titled people with OBEs sat on these boards and doing nothing. And, and I told her what I thought. And I think she was quite shocked because what it is about these people is that they're trained in a certain way and they're trained to be very audacious and to take control. And what I found is that it's quite easy to unnerve them because all you have to do is keep asking them the same questions. In other words, it's mm -hmm. the same with consensus. It's the same with when they try to push things in local councils. Most of it's about diversion and psychological manipulation. So, in other words, change agents are using psychological manipulation in a corporate kind of way. And it's, it's on every level. And I, I, yes, I don't get too convoluted here. I just gave that as an example. But it starts off with people like that who are basically what I would call useful idiots working within organizations. But at the extreme end of it, we're going into what you could describe as domestic terrorism. And I've seen examples of that as well. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to domestic terrorism, you think, wait a minute, these people can libel you, they can threaten violence, they can break into property, they can steal, they can commit fraud, and the police are doing nothing about it. Mm -hmm. And this brings me to a very important point, because this Extinction Rebellion protest is being facilitated by the police. If me and you went out and started demonstrating about something and more than 10 people turned up, there's a good chance we'd all get arrested for breach of the peace, right? Absolutely. Um, they just, you, they, and then the next thing is, you're gonna get your door kicked in. That's the way it works in this country. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Why are these entitled whinging idiots being allowed to glue themselves to buildings to stop emergency vehicles going in and out? To basically, the whole thing's a pantomime. And that's the question people should be asking because (laughs) this is really the role of the change agent. So Gail Bradbrook is the change agent. Um, Roger Hallam, I think he's just kind of a tool. he's He's been trained in these techniques because basically these people know nothing practical. You know, they they know nothing about life at all, but they know about this kind of level of psychology. And that's what I would say. If you look at people working in your local council hitting quite high office, look at the role that they're playing. And then you can see basically how change agents work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as I said, like I did, uh, I did listen to Gail in that interview recently, and she really came across as someone who was essentially as dumb as a rock. I don't mean that in in a derogatory way, you know. What's did I read something before about Gail uh, having dinner at or having lunch or something at Ten Downing Street? I'm not sure about that. People are very well embedded, and that is also a sign of a change agent. Yeah, they get pushed into areas which we would normally not be able to get into. Yeah, and I've no I've noticed this. Now these people are chosen and mentored, and people will go, "How does that happen?" Well, it happens in the education system. It happens with especially Oxford and Cambridge, actually more Cambridge than Oxford. I've known a lot of real domestic extremists come out of Cambridge University, and they're being trained into this kind of mentality, and basically it's a it's a corporate mentality, and they are now becoming lobbyists. So what you've got in effect is you've got a shadow government which runs things, which was what the United Nations were saying in the in the early 90s. They were saying that the future would be this web of NGOs and organizations, uh, government and non-government organizations, which would be working basically as a new form of government. I mean, I've got some quotes that are really interesting on that. But I, I think this is the crux of where it is, really. You have to look at what the intended outcomes are, you know? Yes, yes. And what's, um, what's George Soros's role in Extinction Rebellion? Or does he have a role? Or is it just, is he funding that? Or, or is he, does he have any kind of role? What's the story there, uh, Mark? Yes, it's given quite a lot of money. But if you look at what Open Society does, and Media Matters, which is his media company, then you see a template. You see the kind of politics that we get on democracy now, which is basically this extreme leftism. Now, I don't go into left and right Mm -hmm. because I see those as below what we're talking about. We're talking about a new system of governance here. So left and right, basically the two lies for people to argue over. But one thing that is quite interesting is that this so-called extreme left is what gets all the funding. Now, we've also got this kind of alt-right, which is a created thing as a reaction to that. So, in other words, this is below what we're talking about. But Soros does want this kind of global totalitarian government, as did Maurice Strong, Mm -hmm. who basically became the head of the UN. Mm -hmm. So, when you start looking at these people, what they want, then... Is that what's happening? Yes, it is, because they want the end of nations. And ultimately, they want this global governance template. Mm -hmm. It's a new form of communism, but it's beyond communism. So you have to look at what these people actually want. And what's interesting is that it comes from the way they think. And they don't think the way the public thinks. So most members of the public would not even understand what Soros was really up to. They can see the results of it. But it all comes about this new system of control, which is being implemented at the top and always has been. Mm-hmm. By is, isn't, that, isn't that kind of slogan for I, I, I saw it this morning or yesterday when there were some clips of the Extinction Rebellion, um, the protest marches. And I know the school climate strikers use the same phrase like system change, not climate change. So it's clear it's uh, that's actually what they're after a complete uh, it's like when i told you i, I met recently the uh, climate strikers in cork and um i was trying to ask them some questions you know and they were kind of if you like they didn't like being asked straight questions they didn't really have any answers they kind of said you know uh, or then they suddenly said no you can't record us we're minors 
like they were all 16, 17. And I was like, well, you know, you're here in a public protest. It's a public place. You're here campaigning to have society turned on its head. And, you know, so then they hide behind when, once you challenge them, they hide behind this veneer of, you know, we're minors, you know, so it's um, it, it's interesting. Yeah, what you're saying about about uh, this idea of a system change of a totalitarian world government. Uh, again, I'm kind of bringing it back as it, from my own worldview as a Christian, Mark, you know, in that um, that certainly would be core to my personal belief. If you look at the, I don't know how familiar you are with the Bible and all that, but, you know, the book of Revelation mm. talks about uh, humanity heading towards a one world system, a one world religion. Uh, a one world government which sets up for the arrival on the scene let's say of what the bible uh or what most people would know maybe as the antichrist you know so it's it, it's always interesting interesting to me that when that how do they know that two thousand years ago and the fact that you know we're heading as well towards a cashless society and um i was chatting to someone there recently about uh, about again in the book of revelation where it talks about um uh, mankind that nobody will be able to buy or sell without the mark, you know, on the hand or the forehead, you know. Um, and uh, so, you know, technology now, I, I suppose people have speculated for centuries what that could be, you know. And, you know, we now, we're now in a position where we have the technology to, like we have technology that Adolf Hitler could only have dreamed about as far as, um, uh, let's say, tyrannizing populations, you know. Um, so it's kind of it's it's interesting to me like when it's it's not really a surprise to me when i see organizations like extinction rebellion or the whole climate change movement in general pushing this idea of world governments or a world system of control under a certain elite because i suppose uh, you know i i've always known or i've always believed as a christian that that there is a time coming where that we we are kind of heading towards that well, it's interesting because I would say that when people are approached and they use victim status and basically use internal lies to project onto you, then that is pretty close to evil. And if you look at the kind of belief system, if, if we can say that they have a belief system of people who are following this death cult extinction rebellion, then basically everything they're doing is built on a lie to start with because what they're doing is they're implementing a totalitarian system on the back of a lie called anthropogenic global warming, which was invented for that reason. So they are agents of evil in that respect. Now, that's getting rather esoteric for some people, but once you go away from the inner core of truth, then you're being led into evil. So these people are in the stage of deception. Mm -hmm. So... In other words, they can easily be used as a totalitarian tool to destroy the natural order of things. And that, to me, is the essence of the whole thing. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Mark. I, like, I really, just as a person, I, I, liked, I liked having a nice garden. I like um, seeing a nice, a nice clean street. I like having clean water. These, to me, are what your average everyday person on the street likes to have. So in that sense, your average decent person on the street is uh, and naturally, by in, in a natural set, sense, is instinctively an environmentalist. But what we're talking about is a different kettle of fish altogether when we look at these groups, you know, and like, like I look at the modern radical environmental group that are behind this global warming, AGW, the climate change cult, to me, I genuinely, and I'm saying this with all my heart, I really believe it is absolutely satanic and wicked. It absolutely. is. I, I agree with you entirely. And I, I know it doesn't make for very good radio sometimes when you agree with everything someone <laughs> says, but I think we're getting to the core of what's going on here because I think you have to see it in this polarised way because if something's not true, then it's untrue. If yes. it's untrue, why is it untrue? Have they made a mistake in their judgment? Well, a lot of them have. However, are these people extremists? Can they be led to do things which are going to have a negative effect on other people? Yes, they can. Mm -hmm. That's why I call it, it's almost like comedy Bolshevism. And all right, there's a funny side to it. You've got these entitled idiots who think that lying down in Waitrose is a protest. You know, I mean, you couldn't make this up. This is sitcom material, yeah. you know. 
Yeah. And it's so absurd that it's hilariously funny. But the problem is that you've got them linked to this extreme leftist ideology, which is like Antifa. So how far away are these people from Antifa? I mean, I've been attacked by these groups and they are intolerant. And this is a kind of the totalitarian regime that's been brought in. And w what it's all about is destabilizing what used to be called normality. You have to you have to destroy that to bring in this new order. And when it goes back to it, you look at the goals of what they call cultural Marxism, which people say it's an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. No, it was a movement, actually. And it was people like Antonio Gramsci. And when you look at these people in the late 1800s and when they went over to America in the early 1900s, they were called the Institute of Social Research. Now, this is a really important point that gets back to what we were talking about earlier. In my view, psychology and psychological manipulation is at its very foundation evil mm -hmm. because I've seen every single branch of what psychology does and I would say pretty much all of it is based on a lie and it's based on the control of other people. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, if you like, it's kind of usurping uh, people's free will really, you know, to, yes. it's a way of um, hacking someone's free will essentially. Yes. And I've seen psychiatry, um, which is a, an offshoot, which is the medical offshoot of psychology and the results of all this and the misery that it causes and the people involved in it. And in my view, I'm not saying all psychologists are evil. I'm saying that the foundation of it is based on a lie. And once you start using these groups and psychologically manipulating them, which, what's, which is what globalists are doing with these middle class kids who think they're protesting, then that's a pretty evil thing because those kids think that they're doing yoga on Westminster Bridge and they're going to basically change the world and there's that we're in a climate emergency. Well, no, we're not. And they don't even seem to, the, the thing is that they don't seem to be interested in the science. Mm -hmm. And that is very worrying. Now, I'm just going to read something. This is from the Media and Messaging Working Group of Extinction Rebellion. Now, interestingly, we can get onto this in a minute. Mm -hmm. Internal documentation has been leaked. And I was told at the very beginning, because I've got internal documentation from the dragons of Extinction Rebellion, which are pretty nasty, and they protect the inner core, just as they did in Occupy. Now, that's what we're talking about when we're saying they have a similar inner structure. It's exactly the same inner structure. And the, the whole point of um, this is that it's a template. So it says here, the media and messaging working group of Extinction Rebellion. This, this was released, and it's on What's Up With That, which is a great site. What's up with that? Yeah, I know. The and he managed idea. to get hold of it. Mm. I've, I've been sent it to. But let me just read this out. This is one of their aims to build structure, community, and test prototypes in preparation for the coming structural collapse of the regimes of Western democracies. Now, that is exactly what George Soros wants to bring about. So, how did that become one of their aims when they're meant to be an environmental protest group? Mark, can you just read that out again? Because there was a slight yes. glitch uh, when, when you were halfway through sure. it. To build structure, community, and test prototypes in preparation for the coming structural collapse of the regimes of Western democracies, mm -hmm. democracies in inverted commas. Mm -hmm. Now seen as inevitable due to stored up crisis, thus preparing a foundation to transform society and resist fascism slash other extremes. Well, they don't seem to know the meaning of any of these terms they use. <laughs> no, uh, it says this includes creating rising from the wreckage, a citizen's assembly based on sortition. Now, yeah. who put this into their highly yeah. inactive and minuscule brains? <laughs> this is what we need to know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Gas, isn't it? And uh, Mark, I'm just curious, what do you... I, I, I noticed it again, yes, I was watching the Extinction Rebellion protest in um, 
I might have been outside the Houses of Parliament. I, I, you know, I know I mentioned this to you before about uh, a lot of this kind of religious pseudo religious imagery that they actually use in their protests. Like in Dublin, outside the government buildings, they were pouring fake blood over their um, over their uh, counterparts who were kneeling down. I saw on the one in London yesterday, uh, they were kind of dressed in these robes. It was like something out of the Tom Cruise film, Eyes Wide Shut. You know. <laughs> What what do you reckon is behind this uh, religious imagery? Because that's what it looks like to me. Or that's 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 how I perceive it when I look at it. Well, the climate change agenda is religious. It is a religion. It's a religion which came out of the cult of Gaia to save the earth. Mm -hmm. In other words, it comes out of neo paganism. Mm -hmm. It comes out of the manipulation of people's need to feel connected to the earth. However. What this does is takes them further away because they're being lied to. Yes. And all of this imagery, it's been quite well worked out. Uh, but there's nothing new here. This is very similar to what was going on at Occupy. The thing is now that this is bigger because the agenda is further down the line. And we are going into the whole social engineering, let's just say of this country, but of the world, through the UN and through conferences that people know nothing or little about, which you can easily find out about and we report on. And this is very near to completion. Now, what does it tie in with? It ties in with the Internet of Things. It ties in with surveilled smart cities. And it ties in with what you were saying, the cashless society and the microchip. This is the end game of the whole thing. And a lot of people will look at the conspiracy world and go, oh, yeah, People have been saying that for ages. Well, the reason they've been saying it for ages is because it has been a long-term plan. And the idea of it is based on the... the you see, the thing is that it's, it's interesting you're, you're coming from this Christian religious perspective because that's the, in a way, that's the antidote to it. Mm -hmm. Because the godlessness and the emptiness and the lostness of the mind is what's opened up people to this and the costumes and the imagery and the blood i would say it's very kind of it's very banal in a way but when you see those lot dressed up in in the in the red costumes it is a bit sinister mm -hmm. but it's a cult it's a very similar to some dystopian sci-fi movie in fact it could easily be out of a, a, a very successful dystopian sci-fi movie because they've got the they've got the logos, they've got these costumes, they've got this kind of apocalyptic um, nightmare scenario going on. It really is pop culture, but it's a mixture of pop culture and something very sinister like what you're saying yeah I, I agree i absolutely agree isn't there a logo uh, this kind of x thing isn't that supposed to be like an hourglass or something like that you know to indicate the time is running out is that correct yes yes and it can be put into the two interlocking triangles mm. which is a symbol of a certain country but all well it's a created country mm -hmm. but it also goes back into the occult because it's the as above so below this is a magical sign mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you've got to look at if you put all that together mm -hmm. um this has been thought about by people who do know a bit and that is where the sinister aspect comes in because there's nothing naive about this concept the naivety is the people who follow it but the concept is actually fairly clever because it's aimed directly at the mentality of the people who they need. So it's a good little bit of social engineering. But I find the symbolism very sinister mm -hmm. because I know about symbolism. Now, some people get too wrapped up in symbolism. But it's interesting, for instance, that at the top, and we're talking about people who are controlling things, symbolism does seem to be important to them. And I'm not just saying that because I've seen it on the Internet. I'm saying that because having met people over the years who are very high up, there is a belief in high up thinking, once you get past social Darwinism, to people actually believing in the supernatural and manipulating. See, the manipulation of energy, which is what this whole movement is about, is a kind of black magic anyway.
because it's controlling people's energy. If you're controlling people's energy, then it's black magic as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Isn't it isn't it true, Mark, that, you know, your average if you're you know, if the average person on the street just heard what you said there, they would kind of go, oh, you know what? That's a lot of baloney. You know, I don't believe that. But isn't it really the important thing is that these elite or these people, they do believe it. And that's what actually makes the difference. And that's why they're pursuing it. Well, yes. You see, the thing is that the, the education system produces people who fit into the roles that they have to play. Now, the people who are controlling them are from a different form of education and they have access to different information. So the people who go through the education system will say, oh, that's a load of conspiracy theory nonsense because they've been told to. And the actual purpose of education is to direct and prevent change in the individual. And that's the principles of secondary education, which came out in 1918. Mm -hmm. And basically what they want is a compliant citizen. Now, that doesn't mean that it's like over mind control. It means that that you're given artificial wounds that you believe are real. Now, once you get into a different level of thinking, the artificial wounds disappear. So reality becomes a lot bigger. And I will say in defense of what I've just said there, that I know from personal experience and the experience of being around others that this supernatural element does exist and there's people manipulating energy for very nefarious purposes. And that energy can be focused and turned on people. And we, once you get to the highest level of it, it can basically start something like this Extinction Rebellion. Because Extinction Rebellion is a hive mind. It's people who've lost their minds. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. the lostness of the mind. Mm -hmm. So if someone's lost their mind and they're open, it's a bit like a gateway, mm -hmm. say, um, they've they've opened themselves it's a up blank canvas really isn't it mark yes and that's what you were saying i think about roger hallam that you saw something sinister in there now the reason you see something sinister in there is because he's a conduit for something that he probably doesn't even understand and i've seen this before i have seen possessed people and what's interesting actually and a, and a kind of comedy element to this is that people who are possessed can be very charismatic now, you've got these two complete muppets like Hallam and, and Bradbrook, who they have no charisma whatsoever. It's, it's almost like they've chosen people with no charisma because they are not good at fronting that movement. They're not they're not they have nothing to say. Mm -hmm. They can't articulate properly. They they are not good leaders. So in other words, they're, they're not needed because everything's already in place. And what's sinister is what's behind it. And when you get to the inner core of it, the dragons and what they sent to my friend when he asked them questions, mm -hmm. the s mixture of sinister and very petulant, you know. I was just thinking there when you mentioned there about people being possessed, you know, one of my favorite films is the film The Matrix. And if you remember um, from that movie, you know, the what were called agents in the movies, the bad guys essentially would take control over people's bodies, you know, to to kind of carry out their will. So it's kind of the same reader. Like when, you know, when when I see people like you were talking there about, you know, you've seen people who are possessed. And, I, you know, again, we're back to the whole spiritual supernatural element, which I believe is a Christian that I really do believe. Like I, I mentioned a verse in the Bible earlier about uh, people you know, from First Timothy, people abandoning the faith and following deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. And um, I would very much put a lot of what's going on there, the Roger Hallam territory, Gail Bradbrook, what's behind this organization as a group of individuals, as indeed following a doctrine, if you like, that that is spiritual in origin. Because, I mean, the implication is that if the eco movement the radical eco movement is satanic, which I believe it is, and wicked, then that in my mind implies there's some kind of spiritual force behind it and orchestrating it and orchestrating its its direction. And, you know, the idea too that certainly people can be um, very charismatic when they are under the spiritual influence of some kind of demonic force. I mean, you could say even that Adolf Hitler would have been a classic example of that, in that the Nazis, 
you know, were heavily involved in, in, in the occult and uh, those kind of uh, spiritual practices, you know? Well, it's interesting because a lot of this goes back to this ancestral idea, doesn't it? And you find that a lot with the New Age, that they want to be in touch with their ancestors and all this sort of thing. Well, I don't know much about my ancestors, whether they were good, bad or indifferent, but this is another part of it, isn't it? It's like being possessed by things you don't really know about. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this, I've found, is the most irresponsible thing about the whole New Age movement when they talk about things like channeling. Now, channeling just means opening up your psyche for anything to jump into it, basically. Mm -hmm. And only a fool would do that, in my opinion, because, I, again, I can speak from experience here, and I've seen the terrible destruction of people through not only drugs, but also this possession. I know people have been possessed spiritually, mm -hmm. and I've had people who have been possessed spiritually um, uh, psychically attacking me. And and this stuff is real and it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of people realize how powerful it is mm -hmm. because the the forces that are around, this is the whole problem with it all, is that the New Agers open themselves up to what I would call low-level demonic possession. By low-level, I mean that they're not doing anything particularly powerful, but they're opening themselves up to kind of lower dimensional entities which can basically just mess them about and i've seen what this ha this happened through drugs i've seen it happen through drink mm -hmm. that's why they call it demon drink i mean we've all seen that <laughs> people slipping yeah. out of alcohol yeah, yeah, yeah. but the bible, and, it's interesting you say that now mark because you know the bible does talk about if you like a hierarchical structure in the spiritual realms you know so the Theological, I suppose, implication is that um, if you like, like Jesus himself referred to, um, you know, his key referred to, you know, the kingdom of God as a kingdom and likewise the kingdom of Satan as a kingdom. And you know that in any kind of kingdom or kind of um, structure like that, it you know, you have your princes and it goes down to your, um, uh, you know, the lower structures or the lower, uh, let's say, low grade entities as you kind of. Uh, pointed out, I'm sure Adolf Hitler wasn't possessed by a low-grade entity, you know. So, um, so yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. It's a very interesting thing, and I've actually experienced psychic attack and this sort of stuff happening. And it's not sort of stuff I bring up on the shows because we're really talking about the sort of social engineering and and this kind of way that our reality is presented to us. But I did a show, in fact, several shows with a chap in. America called Jerry Marzinski and I only knew him as Dr. J then I found out that one of my friends knew him I said you know Dr. J he said yes Jerry Marzinski so I Jerry Marzinski worked as a psychiatric practitioner in one of the biggest mental hospitals in America Milledgeville in Georgia and he was dealing with a lot of people who'd been uh, drug addicts like methamphetamine and he, he was saying that his view was that paranoid schizophrenia not just schizophrenia schizophrenia is a rather broad term, but paranoid schizophrenia, where people hear voices, mm -hmm. um, was definitely some kind of possession because he found out that the voices were not hallucinations. In other words, the voices actually had coherence and what the voices were telling these people to do was actually leading them into a series of events. Mm -hmm. And that is incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. So the whole study of this area is something that I'm fascinated about. Yes. Um, yeah, that's very, yeah, that's very, very interesting, Mark. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Totally. You've probably seen it yourself in newspapers when some sensational event happens or a murder or the guy is saying or the girl, you know, the voice has told me to do it or do you know what I mean? So I, I certainly would believe in, in instances like that, that there is demonic influence, no question about it. Um, if you think about it, really, that demonic being, beings are, they are kind of, they're not limited by... Um, by the laws of physics, you know, so they can slip in and out of other dimensions quite well, easily. They're outside the, the, the experience of people until they have that experience. So people who haven't had that experience will say that's a load of rubbish because they've not had it because it's outside their experience. And people are trained through the education system to believe that anything outside their experience doesn't exist because they're trained into a very narrow reality. And they're trained into a narrow reality because it's for their own custodial good. 
as far as social Darwinism, people who want to actually control them, like change agents, uh, well, change agents at the top here, I'm not talking about the ones in local council, who, who want to control society for the great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, good. and I've actually met some of these yeah. people who were related into these sort of elites, you know. And we and leave, we leave, their, yeah, sorry, of, go on. No, I, you keep going, Mark. Sorry, go on. Yes, their view is that because of their level of education, that they have a custodial duty to impose mm-hmm. these beliefs on, on the rest of the population. Now, that is a bit of an absurd kind of assumption, but it's all down again to this idea of social Darwinism. But mm-hmm. when you get above that, there are people who do think really differently. So it's all about people's life experience. And I've always found it extremely important to try and elevate myself to get information that wouldn't normally be available to me. And what I do find is that I'm very quick now to sort through what's going on. In other words, 99% of what I hear doesn't interest me at all because it's not giving me any information. And this is the kind of higher thinking, I believe, that they're, that the elites, the real elites, I'm not talking about the billionaires, I'm talking about people with elite kind of thinking. That's the way they think. And again, it takes me back to my point that those people have a strong belief in the supernatural. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of like interesting because in the West here, uh, in Europe, uh, the, the first world, let's call it, people have become very... Uh, let's say secularized in that they they don't really pay much attention to the supernatural or the spiritual side of of humanity so therefore if you if you say to someone you know if what you said to me a while ago i I know certain people who were possessed uh, i've actually met people like that as well myself they would kind of look at you as if you had two heads because we've been so secularized away from that um, that that sense of um, uh, of belief in, in in such events, but if you go to the third world, or if you go to Haiti or Africa, or India or places like that, it was a friend of mine. He was in Nepal there some years ago. He went there as a Christian missionary, and he came across um, uh, possessions on a quite a regular basis. You know, so in these third world nations areas you will find people are more if you if you talk to them about possession they'll they'll kind of be yeah yeah they're quite familiar what you're talking about whereas the uh first world we've become quite closed to spiritual issues or to um to belief in in certain things like that in the mind of a first world person these things are kind of myths or legends or fairy tales are just not plain nonsense well, yes, again, it, because it's outside the experience. I mean, I've spent quite a lot of time in Nepal, mm-hmm. and that's an interesting country because it's always defended itself. Their royal family was killed in the 90s, and they've been taken over basically by Maoist government. And people in that country know who did it and why. It doesn't mean that they can do much about it. But when you're talking about um, possession, it's very interesting. I was there um, up till March this year. And I was in Bhaktapur, which is the ancient capital of Nepal. Mm -hmm. Only goes back to about the 13th, 14th century, which is very interesting because you know that there's got to be a very advanced culture there before because you've got a lot of Mongolians tribes, not Mongolian tribes went a a, a part of Nepal as well. It's got kind of a mishmash of different tribes. And what was interesting, I was in the Nuari part of Nepal and that culture is very old and it's a big culture in the Kathmandu Valley. And they have a lot of festivals. They have Shiva Archery, which is the Shiva festival. They had that when I was there. They also had the Mask Festival. And the Mask Festival is like really kind of strange because they put these big masks on and they do this tribal dancing in the street and they just do it anywhere. It's very exciting because it's it's kind of got an edge to it, you know, because they, it's it's not controlled. It's not like Extinction Rebellion, for instance. It's It really has got an edge to it because these guys really get into it. And you you see that um does that dance does that dance have a meaning or a purpose uh, Mark? the one that i saw was barai and they were basically giving the mask food and then they, they fell apart they dress up in traditional nawari costumes which they don't wash and it's kind of funny because they, they i got introduced to them all through a friend of mine who was a guide and he said oh yeah you can come along with filmers you know um he says but buy a, you know buy us a couple of beers you know <laughs> Yeah. So you've got these guys with masks on, <laughs> maybe these mystical stuff, having a bottle of beer down the yeah. off license. You know, it's, yeah. it's kind of funny. And and it's kind of fun. But there is um, a very, I would say, a dangerous side to that because I didn't see it so much in Nepal, but I saw the, the possibilities of it. And, yes, these 
entities do exist and it's known in other cultures that they exist. You know, I mean, it's kind of common knowledge. It's just that we have been brought up into a, a very materialistic view of the world. And what I liked about being out there was that they're not materialistic in that sense. They have something else about them, which has been taken away from Europeans because it's the whole work ethic. It's this kind of cynicism and it's the control, the mind control. Mm. And I find that people in Britain, I won't say Ireland, I'm sure I'll just say the UK exactly for now. The same, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a shame because the Irish have got this great culture, you know, and, and more and more I hear and see what's going on there, the more despairing it is, you know. Mm. But yeah, We're losing it fast. And people are being kind of mentored into being very anti anything spiritual or interdimensional or supernatural, and they're encouraged to laugh at it. Now, that's a social engineering tool. It's mm. to keep them away from it because it's not for their own good. Mm -hmm. They, the thing is that it's in the nations, it's in the interest of the social engineers, put it this way, to have a, a compliant population who will be very happy to be worked and taxed and have a reasonable life and then die. But they'll be under control for that whole point. Once this supernatural kind of doorway opens or a doorway into other dimensions, if you want to call it, Mm -hmm. All that goes out of the window. So you can't have that in a society. You need to keep people under control, which is what the old fashioned church was trying to do. Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. Catholic church were trying to do that. In fact, mm -hmm. I'm making a documentary at the moment mm -hmm. about the heretics of the 1500s. And it's not so different now as it was then. But those people then were getting burned at the stake. But the interesting thing was they, be, they were willing to be burned at the stake. Yeah. And the Catholic church believed that... But because they were heretics, uh, there, there was no salvation outside the universal church. And these were Christians and some were Catholics, by the way, mm -hmm. and few were Anabaptists and this, these um, kind of fringe religions. But mainly um, they were people who went against the universal church, but were Christian. Mm -hmm. um, some were, were called Protestants, some weren't. Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting about it is that the, the act which delineated the rules um, apart from 1302, which was the papal bull, Unum Sanctum, which said there is no salvation outside the universal church mm -hmm. and that every human creature should be basically under the rule of the Roman pontiff. Now, that's very interesting because the when they when they say creature, they don't say divine human being. Yes. They say creature. And, mm -hmm. and you'll know, being um, you know, familiar with the Bible, that we had dominion over the earth and all creatures and everything that creepeth on the earth mm -hmm. so by making us creatures they were taking away our divinity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and this is an incredibly important thing i think is that this secularization of society that we have now it takes away divinity and it makes it laughable and i mm -hmm. think that's why you've got this undercurrent of evil within a lot of people in other words they think it's okay to lie mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you see what i'm getting at here no, i see exactly um, what you're getting that's very interesting yeah, very very interesting that, called the it was there was a, an act, it was called the act of six articles which came out in about 1538 i think the act of six articles was otherwise known as an act of abolishing diversity in opinion now how draconian can you get an act that abolishes diversity in opinion and basically yes it was so, it was very the, familiar <laughs> yes and it was about the belief in the Eucharist. So in other words, if you didn't believe that transmutation from wine and bread into the blood and flesh of Christ was real, then you were a heretic. Mm -hmm. So this stuff is incredibly fascinating. And it's my view is that the control structures of the church do exactly the same thing. They need to limit people's access mm -hmm. to higher information mm -hmm. and spirituality. Isn't it interesting, Mark, I'd like you to finish your point in a second, but isn't it interesting um, about having access to information around that time the printing press was um, was invented and it was because of the printing press where people finally had access to the scriptures. They could read the Bible for themselves. And if you like put two and two together and say, okay, what the church is teaching, or in this case, the Roman church, doesn't quite line up with what the Bible says, you know, 
and um, like what you're talking about there about access to higher information if you like it kind of uh, not having access in this example to the scriptures in one sense made the population reliant on what the priest class if you like uh, told them the scriptures actually said which didn't necessarily mean that that's what they actually said it's just what they want them to what wanted the population to know uh, the scripture said but having the printing press yes. Yes. Uh, it gave them access to that higher information they could read for themselves you know or learn to read at least you know because in those days not it was really um, not everyone uh, in fact the majority of the population were, were pretty much uneducated and couldn't read absolutely and it was people like Wycliffe and Tyndale mm -hmm. who actually translated the Bible along with Miles Coverdale. And these people were incredible scholars. They could read Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Aramaic. They were, they were incredible. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they made this Bible, which was a small Bible, which just had the Gospels in it, and they used to carry it around. And it was illegal for them to have this. And one of the characters in the film, I mean, we're going up sort of on a tangent here, Anne Askew, she was from landed gentry, and a lot of the heretics were actually very highly educated people and lawyers and people high up in society, which is incredibly interesting. In other words, they were burning them because they knew that they were a direct threat to the existing order. Mm -hmm. And they believed that they had direct communion with Jesus Christ. And the Catholic Church couldn't allow that. They had to have the priest as the middleman. Yeah. So in other words, it's like agency. Mm -hmm. The priest is always your agent. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have access to higher information yourself. Mm -hmm. And that, again, is what the custodial view of society is about. In other words, it's not for you. Us people who are trained in the ecclesiastical doctrine can understand it because we've studied it, but you can't understand it for yourself. You need us to interpret it for you. And that's what the argument was about. And the heretics had very simplistic but very direct arguments and some of them were incredibly clever mm -hmm. and it's the same thing now with this hate speak law because a heretic merely means one who is able to choose translated from the greek mm -hmm. it means, um, means one who is able to choose mm -hmm. now within this new system we're going to be heretics because we're outside the totalitarian brainwashed worldview. And that's what people like George Soros, Extinction Rebellion, and the billionaires like Maurice Strong in the 90s, what they saw was the same kind of system. In other words, we need now to get rid of religion. The Catholic Church is old fashioned. What we need to do is we need now a universal church of the faithful based on a love and a worship of Mother Earth, which will unite all religions and destroy all continents and countries mm -hmm. and will destroy everything outside of it. And we're going to do this by fairly subversive means. But our end goal is control and it's for the good of everyone. And that is pretty much the way that this is meant to pan out. Mm -hmm. Isn't it true, Mark, or would I be right in saying that this idea of a Gaia, a Mother Earth concept is rooted in Eastern philosophy? Yes, very interesting, that one. These, uh, well, let's delineate here a little bit. There's, there's a few things going on here, and I'd just like to get into that side of it, because the Gaia religion came out of um, James Lovelock. And he was talking about the earth as a living thing. And this goes back to paganism, then neo-paganism, which is the new age. So basically, this is idea that primitive people, so-called primitive people, well, I wouldn't say they're primitive because the further you go back, the more advanced it seems to look, mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about megalithic culture and, and these things that they just can't explain. So I find that incredibly interesting. But the idea is that, yes, they want to take you back to this kind of pagan idea and the eastern thing crossed over directly there was a fella in the 1970s who became secretary general of the united nations and he was called robert Mueller, and he co-opted recruited and gave seats at the un to new age and hindu cult groups now the reason he chose hindu groups was because a lot of rich westerners had gone over to india and they'd fallen into this kind of 
uh, neo-Hinduism, mm -hmm. which wasn't, you see, Hinduism is a massive thing. It's a massive library of, of information. But what they did was they, they latched onto Hinduism in the respect that they became acquiescent. In other words, everything's the way it should be, and, ev and we're going to move with everything, and everything's planned. In other words, that is a system of mind control. If you can get people believing that, you can control them easily. And that was the point. So he introduced the teachings of Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, Annie Besant, and they started a thing called the Mind, Body and Spirit Festival in California. And in that documentary are people who I later met, a group called the Brahma Kumaris, which means Sisters of God. They have basically retreats and centers all over the world. They have a huge amount of money. They were started in the 1930s by a guru. And what I found with my involvement with them, uh, Robin Gibb from the Bee Gees and his wife were very involved with it. And I met Robin and he was a very interesting fella, a musician, and he, he was very sensible. He, he had good things to say. But they'd got very wrapped up in this, as a lot of these 60s people did, you know, um, the, like George Harrison. And I got a bit taken away with it. I want to speak for Robin because I didn't talk to him about that, but he, he was part of the Brahma Kumaris and he was basically quite practical in the way he talked about meditation. I quite liked that about him. But the idea was that they co-opt all these people into this um, Hinduism. Now, what I find about Hinduism, um, can th this, I, I've spent a long time in Nepal and the Hindus I find very inclusive. I find that, you know, to use their, this, you know, yeah. vibrant and inclusive. They're very inclusive. <laughs> they want you to join in. Mm -hmm. They're pretty kind. They're okay. It's all, every, everything's good. They're, I think they're generally good people. I don't go with their religion. I, I find it, to me, is a bit of a cult. And the gods, it's, it's all very kind of a bit like some kind of weird space cult to me. Mm -hmm. But the, some of the writings are brilliant. They're very philosophical. And I've got nothing against Hindus whatsoever. But what happened was, is that they co-opted this Hindu cult into the new age and mixed it up with, again, with the neo-paganism. So you get these people now and they call themselves witches. Well, a witch means a wise woman. And the people who are calling themselves witches are definitely not wise women. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is the whole thing that the, it's a control system. It's another hive mind. Yes. And the this. Yeah, yeah, this paganism thing has been really used. And I think that it's a misunderstanding of what pagan means anyway, mm -hmm. because it's all about basically doing ceremonies and dressing up. Well, that's OK. And then you get these people who call themselves Druids. Well, nobody knows anything about the Druids. They know very little about them because the Romans wrote the, the, the history of the Druids because the Druids didn't write anything. So all of this stuff is very useful to social engineers because they, they, for instance, they have um, 12 wisdom keepers. Now, basically, it's a fancy dress party of people from all over the world. And they talk about things like connection to Mother Earth, consciousness, all these vague concepts that actually mean nothing or they can mean everything and nothing. That's the point. And I find that is really what this social engineering is about. You want to get people who will acquiesce to what you want. So in, in my view, that's why they use these religions and they want to destroy Christianity, because when you get these neo-pagan type religions, which is, a, you know, you've got these rich Westerners who went to Hinduism and then you've got this kind of neo-pagan thing going on. They are really like a fancy dress party and they are not knowledgeable spiritually at all. In fact, they're spiritually, in my view, negligent because they focus in on themselves and they don't actually really work on their own awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mark, can I just, you just touched on something there about how they want to destroy Christianity. Now, um, why Christianity as opposed to other religions? I think because the elements of it are about integrity. And integrity to me within the person means you're incorruptible. So these principles of, say, these new age cults seem to take people away from integrity. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you something really simplistic, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, the, I think there are other reasons why. And it goes into groups who want to destroy Christians. 
But I think it also goes into the once you get into this bad side of the occult, then these teachings of Christ seem to have a power against it. And this has been told to me over and over again. Now, I'm not going, I'm being a kind of Christian, you know, evangelist. I'm not evangelizing about Christianity. What I'm saying is that there's something within the teachings that because they are incorruptible and they caught, they they create integrity within the person, are a danger or an, a direct threat when you want to control people. Mm. And this goes yeah. back... Yeah. Sorry. No, I, no, I was just going to say that I, I think that's very insightful, Mark, um, in the sense that is, is it possible that Jesus was who he said he was or who he claims to be in that sense? Do you know what I'm saying? Is that what sets yes. Christianity now, apart? There's two ways of looking at this, because if you look at the Gospels and you look at the truth within them, it's pretty good. It's stunning stuff. Now, there are there's lots of theories around Jesus, and we have to also remember that these are stories that have been handed down. I mean, may, you may, you know, we may disagree on that point, but I, I'm not sure that the, the essential kind of idea that Jesus existed as a person and then became a supernatural being are that important in a way. It's the actual integrity that comes from it and the, the natural order of things that he was trying to promote. Do you see what I mean? I do, Am yeah. I being a bit vague here? From my perspective as a Christian, obviously, I obviously believed, I believe Jesus was God made man that he was who he claimed to be that he yeah. did all these miracles and he rose from the dead and um like to me the essence of being a christian is having a personal relationship with the lord so i've just all i i suppose i can only speak from my own personal experience i believe god has, comp has radically changed my life you know and yeah. um i suppose what i'm saying is that when i see organizations like extinction rebellion or wanting to are not necessarily extinction rebellion but um various groups let's say like we discussed who have a particular goal to destroy christianity from my perspective i would believe that the reason behind that or the essential just uh, i suppose uh, boiling it all down is the fact that i believe christianity is the truth and that's why it's a threat like Jesus was who he said he was. That's why it's a threat to a lot of what these organizations are, these totalitarian ideologies actually actually stand for, you know. So I suppose that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, look, Mark, we've spent a lot of time talking about spiritual things. Maybe will we just bring things back on course a little? I don't know how you're fixed for, for time, Mark. What's the... I can take I, as long I, as you like. I'm I, really enjoying it. This concludes part one of my interview at Mark Windows. To listen to part two, go to the video description on this video and click on the link at the top for part two. Alternatively, go to my YouTube channel, The Irish Megaphone, and search for Mark Windows Interview Part Two.